Good morning, intrepid travellers. Um, I've got to say that this is only the second time that I've presented this topic. And we went through it yesterday and I was feeling fine about it. And then we came to the show last night and Jeff Stevenson was talking about <laughs> how we'd be talking about circumcision and circumcising. And Lee will tell you that it really rattled me. Um, so uh, a bit nervous and just hope I don't sniff up today. So <laughs> slip up today, yeah. But um, a lot of you are going to be completing, at the end of this week, you're going to be completing a circumnavigation of the world. <laughs> circumnavigation of the world, which is a wonderful thing. And I just thought I'd let you tell you a bit about some of the people that have gone before you and some of the famous circumnavigations in history. And the very first circumnavigation was the Magellan Elcano expedition. Now, Ferdinand Magellan was a great Portuguese navigator. He was born in Portugal to a noble family in around 1480. But when he was eight years old, the other Portuguese, another Portuguese navigator by the name of Bartholomew Diaz went, became the first person to come all the way down the Pacific and find a way around the bottom of South Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope. And then uh, only six years, four years later, the, um, the Italian explorer Columbus, who was working for the main rivals of Portugal at that time, which was Spain, he was trying to find a way to India by crossing west across the Atlantic, and he bumped into some hard stuff, some land, and that was, uh, he discovered the Americas. And then only six years after that, Vasco da Gama, uh, following the route that Diaz had taken down through the, um, the Atlantic Ocean, became the first person to find, actually find a sea route to India and open that, that trading uh, uh, network to the, to the rest of the world. So in 1505, a few years after da Gama had uh, just gone to India, uh, Ferdinand Magellan, uh, when he was 25 years, he travelled with da Gama to India and he spent eight years in that region uh, learning all about the Indian Ocean and about India and also about the trading routes through the Spice Islands and things. He fought some major battles for Portugal at that time, including the Battle of Ju, which was a, a pivotal battle in world history where Portugal uh, was able to then control the Indian Ocean for the next hundred years. And he returned home thinking that this would, he would be rewarded for what he had done. But he fell out of favour with the King of Portugal at the time. And instead of getting a command of his own, he was only offered a place as third mate on a vessel, which he considered an insult, and it probably was designed to be an insult. So he did something extraordinary. He defected to Portugal's main rival, and he went to work for the King of Spain, taking with him all that institutional knowledge that he had about the Indian Ocean, about India, and the Spice Islands. So it was a very valuable thing for Spain. And then in 1513, a couple of years later again, the great Spanish conquistador, um, Belboa, he went overland through the Isthmus of Panama, that really narrow part of Panama. Uh, he battled through jungle and over mountains and fording rivers. He, uh, he had to fight against the, the terrible conditions in that area, the heat, humidity, the tropical diseases. And he was the first person, to, European, to sight uh, what we now know as the Pacific Ocean learning that there was an ocean on the other side of this continent that Columbus had discovered, the Americas. So he went back to Spain and he told them all about it. And Mag Magellan said to the King of Spain, Charles I, well, if the Portuguese have found a way around the bottom of Africa to get to the Spice Islands, perhaps there's a way around this new world, around the bottom of this new world, to get to the Spice Islands, to that ocean that um, Balboa had found. And he volunteered to lead an expedition to try and find out. So he's given five ships, the Trinidad, the San Antonio, the um, Concepcion, the Santiago, and the smallest of all the ships, the Victoria. And he had 270 men, and he set sail on the 10th of August, 1519, from Seville in Spain. They got down to what we now know as Patagonia in Argentina. And this was around about Easter in uh, 1520. And the men on some of the ships were terrified. That they didn't want to go any further. They thought that if they went further, they'd be sailing over the edge of the world. And these men, some of these men included the three of the five captains aboard these ships. And there was a mutiny. Now, 
Magellan was able to quell that mutiny through violence. He arrested the three captains involved and he punished them by drawing and quartering and executing them by drawing and quartering when you, uh, your body is cut in quarters and, and dispersed that way. But there were still other people that were involved in the mutiny as well and he hung them uh, from Spanish giblets on the, the shoreline at Patagonia and he left those bodies along that shoreline to rot uh, over a period of time. But there were so many people involved with this mutiny who didn't want to go any further that he couldn't punish everyone. So he had to forgive a lot of the men, including a man by the name of Juan Elcano. And we'll come to him later. He was the third mate on one of these ships. And so by this time, they didn't have enough men for five ships. So they burnt the San Antonio and went on their... Sorry, they burnt the Santiago and went on their way. And as they were uh, sailing south uh, on the... Um, 1st of November, 1520, which was All Saints Day, they, he discovered an entrance to a channel and he decided to go through that channel. We now know, he called it the All Saints Channel, but we now know it as the Straits of Magellan, named in his honour. But the, a captain of the San Antonio, didn't, his name was Gomez, he didn't want to go any further at all. He was terrified again, so he just turned his ship around and went back to Spain. And now there were only three ships in the fleet. And they came through this Straits of Magellan here, and on the 28th of November, 1520, they sailed out into this ocean. Uh, he was the first person to sail out into this ocean, and he named it the Pacific. And then they travelled northwest, crossing the equator. They went to the Mariana Islands and to Guam, and then they arrived in Cebu in the Philippines. And he met the Raja, uh, a ra man by the name of Raja Hamabond and his wife, the Queen, and he was able to convert them to uh, the Catholic faith. And in return for being converted, he presented them with a statue, a small child statue, which is still known as the Santa Nino di Cebu, or the Holy Child of Cebu. And that is one of the, uh, the Philippines' most venerated, venerated um, uh, religious icons. And every year, millions of people go to the church where it's held and see this, uh, see this statue. But the... Um, the Raja was having problems with a neighbouring uh, island and, uh, of Makatan, and he wanted help from Magellan using the weapons that the Europeans had. Now, Magellan didn't want to get mixed up in a fight between these two provinces. He was trying to uh, create Christianity around the world. So he went to the island, and uh, on the 27th of April, he went ashore with 49 men, but he was met with a... 1,500 warriors from the Makaton people. And he was killed during that, uh, that time, as well as some of his men and other men were wounded. Now, that meant that there was, once again, a lack of men to have for the three ships. So the Concepcion uh, was burnt, and the other men were distributed amongst the remaining two ships. The command of the expedition now went to a man by the name of Ducava, who was uh, captain of the Trinidad. And our old friend Juan Elcano, who had been spared by uh, Magellan when he mutinied off the coast of Argentina, he was put in charge of the ship, the Victoria, the smallest ship that they had at the time. They decided that they'd go to the Spice Islands and they went there and traded for cloves and cinnamon and then they decided that they head back to Spain. But the trouble was that the Trinidad was in awful condition. The ship itself was, wasn't seaworthy. So it was decided that... Um, the Trinidad would stay where it was and undergo repairs, and then they would sail it back the way that it had come, across the Pacific Ocean, through the Straits of Magellan, and back that way. Uh, trouble was that it, didn't, it never made it. Uh, along the way, it was captured by the Portuguese, and it never, none of the men or the ship ever returned um, to uh, Spain. But the other ship, the, um, the Victoria, they decided to leave and go the, exactly the other way, they decided to use the trade winds that were in fav their favour at the time and go the same way that the, the route the Portuguese used, which was across the Indian Ocean around the bottom of, of uh, the Cape of Good Hope. Now, they knew they didn't have permission from the Portuguese to be in the Indian Ocean. If they were caught, they would probably all be executed. So they had to stay away from any uh, Portuguese ports or cities or, or any Portuguese shipping at all. And eventually... On the 6th of May, 1522, they were able to round the Cape of Good Hope, but by this time they were starving. 
they were down to one handful of rice per man per day, perhaps. And on the voyage back, uh, 20 of the men starved to death. But they eventually arrived back in, um, in Spain on the 6th of September, 1522, with only 17 of the 270 men that had originally gone on this expedition. They had never had any intention of circumnavigating the world, but they had done it. Um, and when they went through their, their journals and their diaries and their calendars, they realised that they were a day out, and they didn't understand why. Uh, how could they be a day out with what uh, they were showing in Spain? And later, scientists worked out that uh, they, uh, because of the time difference as they went around the world, and uh, later on, that imaginary line, the, um, uh, the international date line, was set in place. But um, he became a, an absolute hero. The, uh, he was given titles by the king, he was given titles by the pope, and the pope even gave him a crest. And on the top of that crest is a globe, and written across the globe is a, a uh, in Latin, it says, you went around me first. And that was the journey. So, 81,500 kilometres, uh, 50,610 miles, and the Spanish built a replica of the Victoria uh, in time for Expo 92 in, um, in Seville, that was going to be held in Seville in Spain. And that replica actually did the same circumnavigation of the world, followed the same route uh, in, uh, to try and promote Expo 92 in Seville. And it's still available to go and see in Seville. And you can see how tiny it is compared to someone standing here on the wharf. So just a tiny little ship to go all the way around the world. Incredible. The first Englishman and uh, the first man to lead an expedition from start to finish to circumnavigate the world was Francis Drake. He was born in 1540. He was the first of 12 sons. Uh, so they could have, the family could have had their own cricket team. <laughs> Except that he realised that he was English and they were rubbish at cricket. So at the age of 15... <laughs> hey, just, just tell it like it is. At the age of 15, he decided on a career at sea. And at the age of 23, he ventured to the Americas with his uncle, John Hawkins, who was the very first British slave trader. And they became privateers. And they would attack um, Portuguese shipping along that coast of Africa, usually capturing slave ships and then taking those slaves across to the Americas where they would sell them to Spanish uh, plantation owners. But they, were, they had three ships. Hawkins had three ships. And in 1568, these three ships were uh, anchored peacefully in a bay in Mexico where for no apparent reason they were attacked by Spanish shipping, um, warships. Now, two of the ships were destroyed and Hawkins and Drake only just made it al uh, out alive by swimming to the third ship, cutting the anchor rope and escaping out to sea. But uh, he vowed revenge and this is thought to be the, the precursor of why he hated the Spanish for the rest of his life. In uh, 1572, he was captain. He was overall command of two ships, along with 73 men, and they were raiding along the Isthmus of Panama, which the, uh, the English called the Spanish Main. And they heard rumours of these uh, Spanish silver trains or mule trains that were taken ac uh, across land. And so they set an ambush for one, and they captured this mule train, and they were amazed to find that they had 20 tonnes of gold and silver, worth an absolute fortune. Now, they couldn't carry all 20 tonnes, of course, so they buried most of it, they carried what they could, and they fought their way through this dense jungle for 18 miles, uh, trotting cut through the jungle, uh, once again going over mountains and uh, through over rivers, until they actually got to the coast. And the Spanish were in pursuit. They were still 10 miles uh, from their ships, and there was no way they could go along the coast uh, to get their ships. So they built a raft. Uh, Drake and two men got on the raft, they uh, sailed it to their ships, uh, brought the ships back, rescued the rest of the men, and later on they went and, and uh, dug up the, the uh, treasure and took it back to England, and they were, were absolute heroes. But you think you're doing a little bit of sea time at the moment. Um, their circumnavigation of the world actually took a lot longer. Now, Spain and England were, or, sorry, Spain and England were always going to, to come to, to blows again, come to war again. So Elizabeth I sent Drake on a mission to uh, attack Spanish shipping and assets along the Pacific coast of the Americas. And he left 
on the 13th of December, 17, oh, sorry, 1577, aboard his ship, the Pelican, along with four other ships and 164 men. But soon after, they captured a Portuguese merchantman, so now they had six ships in their convoy, in their fleet. But um, because of the loss of men through scurvy, they had to sink two of those ships that they are, now they are back down to four again. Uh, when they um, got to Argentina, Patagonia and Ag Argentina, he actually, Drake could actually see the, the bleached skeletons uh, of the mutineers that um, Magellan had left there 50 years before. So they were still in place, still hanging on those scan uh, Spanish giblets there. And he might have motivated him to do his own execution because he executed a man by the name of Thomas Doherty. Now, Doherty was the protege of Sir Christopher Hatton, who was a man that had very high connections with the crown in England, so a very powerful man. Doherty thought him of himself as the co-commander of this expedition, and Drake disliked him. He thought that Doherty was always trying to interfere. So he brought up trumped-up charges uh, against Doherty of witchcraft and treason. They had a bit of a kangaroo court where Doherty was, was uh, found guilty and sentenced to death. And uh, the two men, uh, Doherty and Drake, uh, dined together. They toasted each other, which is a lovely thing to do. And then um, he was, Doherty was taken out and he was beheaded. Now, this was supposed to be the, the, reason, the precedent. This was supposed to set the precedent why uh, sea captains are the master and commander of their vessel. And no matter what sort of uh, hereditary title you have, no matter what sort of rank you have, no matter who your family connections are or what your marital status is, you are the master and commander. You are the absolute authority on a vessel. <laughs> as long as your wife says that's okay. <laughs> now, they sailed into the Pacific Ocean in September 1758, and Drake decided to change the name of his ship from the Pelican to the Golden Hind. A Golden Hind is a red deer. And it was the, um, the symbol that Sir Christopher Hatton had on his coat of arms. So this was done to try and appease Hatton about the execution of Doherty. They had a lot of success. They found a lot of uh, Spanish treasure ships. They were able to capture those ships and get gold. They also uh, got a lot of um, uh, Chilean wine that had been captured aboard these ships. About nine million US dollars in today's terms. But their biggest capture was a ship that was called Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. And they uh, captured the ship on the 1st of March, 1579, and on board was an incredible amount of wealth. Uh, 80 pounds of gold, a golden crucifix that was studded with jewels and diamonds. Uh, there was 13 chests of jewels and 26 tons of silver, so a huge amount of, uh, of money. He cruised up the coast of the, uh, of the Americas, that Pacific coast, and he stopped in a place that's now called Drake's Bay in California, which is about a 90-minute drive north of San Francisco. And he beached the, the Golden Hind there. They did repairs to the hull. They traded with the local Indians while they were there, and he claimed that land for England. And then he sailed west to what we now know as Indonesia, and he traded in the Spice Islands, filling his ships with spice, and then he headed home. He, once again, he rounded the Cape of Good Hope, uh, and he arrived back in Plymouth on the 26th of September, 1580, with 59 of his original 164 crew members still alive. So much more successful. And this was, as I said, the very first English circumnavigation of the world, and the first one done for the entire uh, journey as commander. Now, there's a lot to talk about with Drake, and I haven't got time to go through it uh, today, but uh, he presented uh, Queen Elizabeth I with a, uh, a jewel, which is now known as the Drake's Jewel, and it's on display at the Victorian Albert Museum. It's, it's gold and diamonds and, and jewels encrusted. And she, in turn, gave him a cameo brooch with her likeness on it, which was something that a queen just didn't give to a commoner at that time. And the queen's half share of the bounty that uh, Drake brought back from that voyage was more than the, the whole of the crown's income for that year, so an incredible amount. He was knighted aboard the Golden Hind on the 4th of April, 1581, and despite what it shows in this painting and what we've, we see on television programs and, and movies, he wasn't actually dubbed by the Queen. She gave that job to 
a uh, French diplomat who was in England to try and arrange a marriage between the, the brother of the King of France and Elizabeth. And she got the diplomat to do it, so that um, gave implicit support of France for what Drake had done to the Spanish. So it was all political. He became the Mayor of Plymouth and a Member of Parliament. And uh, in 1587, uh, King Philip of France, uh, sorry, of Spain was uh, looking to invade England. And uh, he, Drake sailed into the ports of Cadiz and Corona and he destroyed 37 Spanish ships and damaged a lot more. And this delayed the invasion of the, the attempted invasion of England by a year. And it was said that Drake had singed the beard of the King of Spain. But uh, you probably know more about the Spanish Armada than, than I do. The, 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 the myth is that Drake was playing bowls when he was told that the 130 ships of the Armada were sailing, had sailed into the channel. And he said that there's was, was still plenty of time to, to finish our game, uh, giving, the, giving rise to the legend that the English are unflappable in a crisis. I saw some of you guys up in the, um, the buffet the other day when they said they'd run out of chips. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh. But I mean, maybe, I mean, legend, I mean, it's now thought that if this did happen, then uh, it was probably a case of that the tide was an incoming tide. Drake knew that they couldn't sail until there was an outgoing tide, so that's why the, the game was allowed to continue. But against orders, I mean, the British fleet had were no match for the Spanish Armada, and against orders, uh, Drake attacked uh, the, one of the flagships of one part of the fleet, a vessel by the name of the Rosario. And he captured that ship, including a, a, um, a Spanish admiral. And on board that ship, he found another treasure trove. This was the gold that was going to be used to pay the salaries of the, soldier, the Spanish soldiers who had amassed in, um, uh, across on the French coast who were going to be invading England. And once they found out that they weren't going to be paid because Drake had captured this gold, Thousands of them deserted, once again, affecting the potential um, uh, invasion of England. And then on the 29th of July, 1588, they sent fire ships. The, the British sent fire ships into the port of Calais, uh, destroying a lot of the, uh, the uh, Spanish shipping, causing mayhem and havoc and panic. And uh, some of the ships that were able to get out uh, were captured or destroyed by the English fleet out in the Channel. Uh, from this famous uh, painting. Now, as I said, there's a lot more to Drake that I really haven't got time to go through, but he continued to raid Spanish positions along that, uh, that South American coast. He died in January 1596 at the age of 56 from dysentery. And upon his request, he was um, dressed in full armor. He was placed in a coffin that uh, had lead lining around it. And he was buried at sea between the hulks of two English wrecks the Elizabeth, named after his queen, and the Delight in Portobello Bay in, um, in Panama. And he had taken a drum with him all the way around the world on each of his voyages. And this drum is at his hereditary home in England right now. Um, and the, the legend is that if England is ever in danger and someone was to beat the drum, then Drake would return uh, to defend his country. So the very first woman to circumnavigate the world was a French woman by the name of Jeanne Beret. She was the housekeeper to a famous French botanist by the name of Philbert Commerson. And when Commerson's wife died, he and uh, Beret became lovers. And she took her out on expeditions into the field, and she became a uh, very respected botanist in her own right. I mean, she couldn't call herself a botanist because she was a woman, but she was very able. She had great instincts for botany, and she was a great help to Commerson. So when Commerson was selected in 1766 to go on the, the very first French circumnavigation of the world, uh, what was going to be conducted by the French Admiral Bougainville, uh, they wanted, she wanted to go along, and Commerson wanted his lover to go along as well. So they came up with a plan where she would board one of the ships uh, disguised as a man uh, who was going to be his assistant. And they thought that there was probably a little bit of collusion here because the captain of the ship, the atoll, um, he gave up his cabin to Commerson and his assistant, uh, saying that they were going to have a lot of equipment, a lot of specimens when they went through, to, and, and uh, uh, that they would need the room. 
would mean it would be very, very unusual for a captain to give up his cabin, especially on a journey as long as this one. So, as I said, it's probably, you know, he, the captain probably knew something was going on here. Um, they went to Tahiti, and when uh, Beret went ashore, she was pointed at by Tahitian warriors, and they'd said that she's a woman, she's a woman. And she explained to the other members of her crew that she was actually a eunuch. He was actually a eunuch. Um, and that, that she'd been, he'd been captured um, many years before by Ottoman Turks and had been castrated by them. So, in fact, uh, she, was, she was saying that she was a man. But when Cook went to Tahiti, uh, he was told that by the Tahitians that the French who had come before had a woman on their expedition, and he noted that in his diary. And even in Bougainville's journal, dated the 29th of May, 1768, he notes in there that he heard rumours that there was a woman in this expedition. So when they got to the Isle de France, which we now know as um, Mauritius, um, Commerson was sick. He had done an incredible job during this, this journey. He had discovered new species of plants. Um, the Commerson dolphin is named in his honour. He named the Bougainvillea plant after his uh, Admiral, and he discovered a lot more plants and animals and, and things during this journal. He did an incredible job with the help of Beret. But they were put ashore on, at Mauritius, probably because Commerson was ill, but be also because Bougainville didn't want to have to explain that there was a woman on board when he got to France. Now, Commerson died while they were at uh, the Isle de France, and uh, in May 1774, she, Jan Beret, married a, a um, French army non-commissioned officer. She ran a tavern in Port Louis for some time, and then a year after the marriage, she returned to France, now becoming the very first woman to circumnavigate the globe. And initially it didn't receive, the French weren't really interested in it, but Bougainville's son, who was an admiral as well, uh, petitioned on her behalf, and eventually... Her, she was recognised for the job that she did during that expedition, which was outstanding, and she was given a, a pension for the rest of her life. The very first um, Royal Navy ship to circumnavigate the world and the very first ship to circumnavigate the world twice was HMS Dolphin. Uh, she was launched in uh, 1751 and took part in the Seven Years' War, and she took part in the Battle of Menorca, which, as you'll hear in a minute, wasn't much of a battle at all. But it's famous for one thing, because it led to the execution of the highest-ranking British naval officer in history, a man by the name of Admiral John Bing. And what had happened is that the, fortress, the British fortress of Menorca were, had been besieged by the French. So Bing was given instructions by the Admiralty to go to Gibraltar and uh, pick up the fleet there and sail and relieve the garrison on Menorca. But when he got to Gibraltar, he found that the fleet was only a fleet in name only. It was in terrible condition. A lot of the ships were um, not seaworthy. A lot of the crews had deserted. Um, there wasn't enough crew to go around the ships that were in reasonable condition. So he had to send press gangs ashore and bring men back to the ships to try and man them. And a lot of these men had no seamanship experience at all and couldn't use the cannons on board the the ships, but he had his orders, so he sailed from Menorca. And when he got there, he sent messages to the fortress and uh, trying to, so several messages, but never received a reply. So he didn't know what was happening, whether the French had captured the fortress or not. And then just then, a French fleet arrived, and uh, the fleets engaged each other. As I said, it wasn't much of a battle at all. This was the Battle of Menorca. A few broadsides were exchanged amongst both sides, and then Almost by mutual agreement, both sides just turned around and retired from the battle and sailed away. And uh, Bing had a meeting with his senior officers and they all agreed that if what they were doing was pretty useless and that they should return to Gibraltar and refit the, the, uh, the fleet, train the men, and then they could go back and they could retake the fortress at Menorca. So that's exactly what they did. But when Bing got back to Gibraltar, he was summoned back to London and he was charged with a crime of not doing his utmost against the enemy. Now this was, this all came about a couple of years earlier when there was a naval engagement between a, a British ship and a French ship. Um, 
the British ship, the captain, and uh, most of the senior officers, and about half the crew lay dead or wounded on the decks of this ship. Uh, command went to a young lieutenant, inexperienced lieutenant. Now, the battle was in the balance because the French ship was in almost as bad condition, but the young lieutenant surrendered to the French. A few days later, the, Fr the, uh, the British recaptured the ship, and, but the lieutenant was taken away, and he was charged with not doing his utmost uh, to defend the ship and defeat the French. Um, now, that was a charge just one away from cowardice. So he was court-martialed, and he was found to be guilty, and he was sentenced to death, and he was taken out and executed. Now, when the British public and the British press and the British Parliament heard about this, there was outrage. They said that this wasn't fair. If this man had been higher born, if he was a higher rank, if he had had family connections, he would never have been executed. That would never have happened. So in anger, the British Parliament uh, made the Admiralty change the rules of the Discipline Act to say that if anyone was ever convicted of not doing their utmost, then they would suffer the same fate and it would be mandatory to execute that person. Now, as I said, um, now that, was, that came in pretty handy for the British as well because it meant that all the officers aboard the warships knew that if they didn't do, they didn't fight as hard as they could, they could suffer that fate. So it was, came in handy for the Admiralty. But it didn't come in handy for, Cap for Admiral Bing because he was charged with that. Um, the court-martial that was convened had no choice um, to find him guilty under the terms of the, um, the Discipline Act. And they also had no choice but to sentence him to death for what he had done. He hadn't done his utmost against the enemy. But they understood the conditions. They understood that the fleet was in disrepair and that he was trying to do the right thing. So they recommended clemency on his behalf. It was a uh, unanimous uh, request from the court-martial board. The British Parliament agreed with it. Uh, they also recommended unanimously that uh, the sentence be commuted. But the only person that could uh, commute the sentence was the king, King George II. And he was in conflict with Parliament at that time about the, the, the balance of power between the Crown and the Parliament and more so in, against the, um, the Prime Minister of the time, who was William Pitt the Elder. So when Pitt went to the King and, and pleaded the case, said the Parliament wanted this man spared and the sentence commuted, the King dug his heels in and he said no, and he refused clemency. So once again, it was political. So the fleet, including HMS Dolphin, was assembled in Plymouth, and um, uh, Admiral Bing was taken out onto the quarterdeck of his flagship. He, was, uh, he knelt on a cushion on the quarterdeck because when you're getting executed, you don't want to be uncomfortable about it. <laughs> and he was blindfolded, and then he gave the signal that he was ready by dropping a handkerchief onto the deck, and then he was shot by a firing squad of Royal Marines, the, the, uh, the highest-ranking British officer ever executed. But HMS Dolphin, it uh, did a circumnavigation of the world under the command of Commodore John Byron, who was the cousin of the great poet, uh, Lord Byron. And this was the fastest circumnavigation of the world at its time. And it did so well that it didn't have much time to recover from it because the following year, oh, by the way, uh, Byron, Commodore Byron, was the person who claimed the Falkland Islands for Britain. The following year, it... Um, the, the Dolphin was on its way around the world again under the command of Samuel Wallace. And he actually discovered Tahiti during this, this, uh, this voyage. He called it King George III Island at the time, and it was later Kick Cook that changed it back to Tahiti. And he, when um, Wallace was able to get back to England, he was able to tell Cook all about this fantastic island and said it was an ideal place uh, for Cook's mission to the Pacific, where he could observe the, the observation of Venus crossing over, the, the transit of Venus across the sun. And that's exactly what Cook did during his first and, and most famous voyage of discovery to the Pacific, where he went on to claim what we now know as New Zealand and Australia for the British Crown. So HMS uh, Dolphin was the first uh, British Royal Navy vessel to circumnavigate, and as I said, the first to circumnavigate twice. The first person to circumnavigate solo was a man by the name of Joshua, Joshua, sorry, Joshua Slocum. 
He was born in 1844 in, um, in Nova Scotia in Canada, but he later became a naturalized American citizen. Uh, he ran away to sea at the age of 14 and became a cabin boy and then eventually worked his way up through all the ranks until he was later a master of his own vessel. And then in 1871, he traveled to Sydney and had a whirlwind romance with an, a woman there and they had seven children. They got married and had seven children. And then he, uh, he purchased an 11.2 meter uh, gaff rig sailing vessel that he named the Spray. And he decided that he was going to sail solo around the world. That's what having seven kids does to you. And so he left uh, Boston, Massachusetts on the 25th of April, 1895. And he arrived back, uh, back there in June 1898 to Newport, Rhode Island, becoming the first person to circumnavigate the world solo. And uh, he didn't get much publicity for it because that was when the Spanish-American War had started, which captured all the headlines. And it wasn't until a year later when he published a book, Sailing Alone Around the World, which became an international bestseller, that he got some recognition. And uh, there were some, some fantastic uh, reviews for this book. Uh, one person said, boys who do not like this book ought to be drowned at once. <laughs> and another one said, I do not hesitate to call it the most extraordinary book ever published. Um, that was probably his mum who said that, because I've read it and it's, you know, it's a good read, but it wouldn't go that far. Uh, he, um, he did speaking engagements around the world. He became a very good friend of Mark Twain and was only one of a few people that were asked to speak at the funeral of Mark Twain. He also met Teddy Roosevelt and he went, Roosevelt went sailing aboard the spray with him. He went to the White House to meet uh, Roosevelt there. But he sailed for the West Indies on the 14th of November, uh, 1909 and was never seen again. Uh, he had never learnt to swim during his, his lifetime. His wife in 1924 had him declared dead. The youngest person to ever sail around the world solo is a young girl by the name of Laura Decker. She was born in 1995 in New Zealand um, to Dutch parents and uh, for her eighth birthday she received a copy of the book Maiden Voyage by the American Tanya Ibai who was the first American woman to do a solo circumnavigation of the world. And at the time, between the ages of 18 and 21, she was the youngest person to circumnavigate the world. Um, when she was 14, uh, Laura decided to take a friend's boat uh, for away for six weeks alone, just with her dog Spot for company, and, and that was it. And then uh, a couple of years later, she sailed solo to England from the Netherlands. When she got there, the, the English authorities found out she was on her own and they were incredible about the whole thing. They, they, were, they impounded the boat and they took her to live in a children's home for a period of time. Um, they rang the parents and said, you know, this, this is wrong. You shouldn't be letting her do this alone. Come and get your daughter. The parents said, just send her back to a boat and she'll be fine. Um, but they wouldn't release her until the, the father went over, flew over to England signed her out of the children's home, took her down to her boat, put her on, undid the ropes, waved her goodbye, flew back to the Netherlands and saw her back there a few days later. And then in August the same year, she announced to the world that she was proposed to be the youngest person to sail solo around the world. And once again, this caused an outrage because uh, the child welfare authorities in the Netherlands were very much against this. They actually put a court order in place to stop her from doing it. And there was a lot of public opinion at the time. Australians would be aware about the Jessica Watson situation, but there was a lot of public opinion about this as well. And it went both ways. I mean, what right does the government have to interfere with what a, a parent is allowing a child to do? On the other hand, if the parents aren't going to be responsible, then the government has to step in to, to try and protect that child. So it went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. But in... Um, uh, July 2010, the courts ruled in favour of the parents and the ban was lifted and she uh, decided that she was going to continue on this journey in her boat, the Guppy. So she sailed from uh, Gibraltar on the 21st of August 2010. She actually wanted to leave from the Netherlands but she wasn't old enough to have a boating licence in the Netherlands. Go figure. And then she arrived back in Gibraltar on the 21st of January 2012. Once again, uh, a much longer circumnavigation than the one uh, some of you people have done. She was 16 years old and 123 days, and her voyage had taken her 510 days, or one year and five months. 
The fastest boat to circumnavigate the world it always holds the title of the Jules Verne Trophy. And at the moment, that's held by a boat called Idex Sport, which circumnavigated the world in September 2015 in only 40 days, 23 hours, 30 minutes and 30 seconds at an average speed of 26.85 knots, which was just incredible when you can consider the, the concentration the crew would have to have to go that sort of speed for that amount of time. Just amazing. No talk about circumnavigation uh, would be complete without speaking about one of the great people to circumnavigate the globe, and that was Steve Fawcett. And uh, some of you might remember I did a talk a couple of weeks ago about um, the world's greatest living adventurer, uh, Fedor Konyakov. Uh, Steve Fawcett was the inspiration for Fedor to do so many different, um, circumnavigate the world and have so many different types of adventures. He made a fortune in the financial services industry and at one time he held more than 100 world records and at the time of his death he still held 60 of those world records. He, um, in 2002, after six failed attempts, he took off from northern and western Australia on, with his hot air balloon, the Spirit of Freedom, and he did the very first circumnavigation in a hot air balloon around the world, arriving back, uh, landing back in Queensland after missing Western Australia. The first person to complete an uninterrupted and unrefueled solo circumnavigation in the world. So it took him 13 days, 8 hours and 33 minutes. And then he went in 2004 aboard his uh, yacht, his catamaran Cheyenne, and he won the Jules Verne, tr Verne Trophy for the fastest circumnavigation in the world uh, in 58 days and 9 hours. He held 15 world sailing records and numerous race records around the world. In 2004, he set an airship uh, world record for speed in his Zeppelin NT. And then he took, uh, in 2005, he took uh, Richard Branson's ship, the Global Flyer, uh, Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer. And you can see him in here. I mean, you can see how cramped that is. And he became the first solo, non-stop, unrefueled uh, fixed-wing aircraft flight around the world. It took him 67 hours cramped up like that. And then over the next two years, he spent, sent uh, more uh, records for long-distance flights in the same plane. Just an amazing man. Uh, he's won several awards, including aviation's highest award, the gold medal, and he's inducted into the Aviation Hall of Fame, uh, the Balloon and Airship Hall of Fame, uh, Yachtsman of the Year, Explorers Medal from the International Explorers Club, he won the Harman Trophy for the world's most outstanding aviator and aeronaut, the Magellan Medal, which goes to uh, someone who has done an amazing circumnavigation of the world. Um, he's in the International Air and Space Hall of Fame, but he took off in a single-engine aircraft on the 3rd of September 2007 from Nevada and was never seen again. Um, there was an extensive search for him around Nevada, which took weeks. Uh, but his body wasn't found until a year later, a hiker was walking through the Sierra Nevada ranges and they came across his ID, his wallet. And when they did a, um, a search around the area, they found the body of Steve Fawcett. So, once it's, like I said, an amazing uh, circumnavigator and someone that uh, uh, you're following on from. So, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, that's um, some of the people that you, your forebears in circumnavigating the world. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll be back in a couple of days' time to talk to you about some of maiden voyage mishaps. <laughs> See you then.